Welcome, everyone. We're going to uh, get started here. Uh, this webinar uh, is sponsored by the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis, which is based at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, the Institute is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. It is a synthesis center designed to foster the interface and connections between quantitative approaches and biological sciences broadly across biology. Uh, our webinar today is on the costs and benefits of defending against viral infection, lessons from natural ecosystems, and it is going to be presented by David Talmy, uh, who is here at uh, NIMBIOS, as well as in the Department of Microbiology here at the University of Tennessee. Uh, I am your moderator. Uh, so um, my name is Louis Gross, and I am the director of NIMBIOS, as well as a professor here in ecology and evolutionary biology and mathematics. Uh, and I will be dealing with the responses uh, that you provide through the questions. So the way to interact today uh, is, uh, first of all, your screen will uh, look like the following. It will have a uh, little uh, window uh, that has the presentation in it. Uh, and at the bottom, a question and answer. If you click on that Q&A, it will bring up a window in the lower part of that window, you can type your question. Uh, and when you type your question in that uh, little window, uh, it will pop up above. And uh, everyone will be able to see your question. Uh, and I will um, pose these at the end of the time period to David Tommy, who is our presenter today. Also, if you see a question there and you would like to upvote it, you can click a little thumbs up and it will move it higher up the queue so that that makes sure that questions that uh, you find most interesting uh, are those that get addressed first uh, in the question and answer period. So our speaker today uh, is David Tommy. Uh, oh, um, I, I should also point out that there is a webinar next week that I will be giving on uh, general approaches to what models are good for and how they work, uh, modeling for a globally connected world. Um, all of our webinars are recorded and are posted on the website for NIMBIOS. If you just go to NIMBIOS and webinars, it'll come right up uh, and you'll be able to uh, just see that there. Um, our speaker today uh, is David Tommy. David uh, comes to us with a joint background in both mathematics and uh, biology. Uh, he did his work uh, in mathematics at both the University of Essex, uh, sorry, University of Sussex and uh, at the University of York and then did his PhD at the University of Essex. All those were in the uh, UK. Uh, he then went on and did a postdoc and was a research scientist at MIT. He is an expert on microbial inter uh, uh, ecosystem interactions uh, particularly on marine systems, and he works particularly on host viral systems in oceans. Uh, so we're very, very pleased that he is taking time to do this. David, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Lou. <coughs> um, and I think I'm off mute, uh, but let me know if I'm not. Um, so uh, today um, I wanted to talk about uh, viruses and some uh, natural ecosystems. Um, so viruses are extremely widespread in nature, and um, they infect many, many different organisms. Um, and, and many organisms um, have to balance the costs and benefits uh, much in the way that we're currently uh, balancing costs and benefits of defending against viral predation. Um, and so um, this process of balancing against, balancing the costs and benefits of defending against viral infection has had a really profound influence um, on natural ecosystems and on, on marine ecosystems. And, and I'm going to talk about some of those today. Um, so just to set the context uh, that, that uh, we're interested in, um, and the scale that we're interested in. So this is Earth, um, and what's being depicted here is a, a composite that's put together by NASA, um, showing a surface ocean, uh, or it's inferring a surface ocean chlorophyll concentration. So chlorophyll is the pigment um, in photosynthesis. Uh, and so where you see uh, in the oceans, rich uh, green, red, and yellow um, areas, uh, these are areas that are uh, phytoplankton blooms. 
where lots of nutrients and light have helped to promote um, the growth of, of phytoplankton. This earth um, is time sped up, um, so the patterns that you see are going over seasonal cycles. But it makes the point that the extent of these blooms um, is comparable in size um, to, to many of the vegetation that's also shown here in terrestrial ecosystems. So this is a, a really uh, large, uh, diverse set of organisms that, that are part of this system, um, and, uh, and they've had uh, really profound influences on the way that Earth has developed. Um, and so my research tries to, to understand some of the complex interactions between these organisms um, that live in these large scales. So one organism um, that's very abundant uh, in the surface ocean is this uh, single-celled copolithophore, um, Emiliania hutzii. Um, so there's many, uh, many different types of plankton that live uh, in the surface ocean. This is just one of them. Um, and so this microscopic image that's being shown um, on the screen here, um, this is showing this very beautiful um, uh, structure that these cells have uh, on the outside um, on their shells. Um, and so it may not look um, this way, but these are photosynthetic organisms. So when we, when we think of photosynthetic organisms, we think of plants often or things that are green, but this does have uh, chlorophyll pigments within it um, and it conducts photosynthesis. That's the only way that it gets its energy. So it's very abundant in the surface ocean. So that um, movie that I showed previously where you saw those patches of, um, of red and, and green, um, often, um, if you go into the water in those areas and you look at what's there, these um, single cells, um, uh, copolithophores, um, uh, often are very abundant, not always, but, but often. Um, so they're very, very small. Um, they're on the order of a millionth of a meter or five millionths of a meter, um, which is five microns or five thousandths of a millimeter. Um, so, so very, very tiny, um, but even though they're very, very tiny, there's so many of them, there's many, many billions of them in the ocean, so they, can, they make up this, this large extent. And so something that's really um, interesting and unique about these organisms is that these lifts on the outside of the, um, of the cell um, that um, are sort of marked with this uh, red arrow here, um, these are called coccoliths, um, and these are calcium carbonate, so this is uh, uh, one of the main um, components of, of chalk. Uh, and so um, we don't know exactly why uh, these organisms have these lifts on the outside of their shells, but one of the hypotheses is that, of their cells, but one of the hypotheses is that they're um, uh, maybe um, acting in some sort of a defensive uh, way uh, against viruses and other grazers um, that affects these organisms. Um, and so, um, these organisms, even though they're just single cells, uh, they are extremely widespread in the surface ocean. So this is a, a different product, a different NASA product to the one that I showed previously. Um, this is uh, a remote sensing product which is inferring the concentration of particular inorganic carbon. Um, many of the patterns are similar. Um, this is a little more um, specific um, in a slightly messy way um, to uh, the coccoliths uh, that, that are on the outside of those um, Emiliani Huxley cells that I showed previously. Um, and those, so this just gives a, an indication um, of how widespread these cells are. Um, and so um, they're just one component of this particular inorganic carbon, but they're um, potentially a major component of that. Um, and so, <clears throat> as you may be able to tell from the way that I'm talking, I grew up um, uh, in London, in England. Um, and so in that part of the world, um, there's a large uh, area of uh, rock formations. Um, some of them are quite famous, so this is marked here. Um, this is the White Cliffs of Dover, um, and so the chalk uh, in the White Cliffs of Dover um, is, is there, and we know that it's there because this uh, land, uh, many thousands of years ago, used to be underwater, and communities of these Dimidiania huxii and, and other coccolithophores um, would, would make these uh, uh, calcium carbonate shells that would sink to the seafloor and deposit um, and over many thousands of years of this happening, these layers were built up and up and up, um, and they left this uh, lasting impression on, on Earth. Um, and so, so um, viruses um, are known to infect um, these Emiliania huxii. Um, and so you might wonder, you know, if these uh, organisms live in the surface ocean where there's lots of light, um, how do they get to the, to the seafloor? Um, well, uh, it's been hypothesized that viruses may play a role in this, right? So viruses 
and other predators, and specifically um, here I'm talking about this Emiliania huxii virus that's so creatively named an EHV virus. Um, so this and other predators uh, infect and kill uh, Emiliania huxii, and then, and then some of the lifts that are liberated as a result of this, the virus is going inside the hosts um, and bursting the, the cells open, um, sink to the seafloor and are involved in the deposition of this calcium carbonate, this chalk, um, that we're uh, used to uh, today. And so the exact role that viruses play um, in the, the, the large-scale uh, cycling um, of the uh, calcium carbonate that's in, that's in these lifts um, is kind of unknown, right? But it's something that we're very interested in. And so one way that we can think about um, asking this question is, well, we know that viruses infect EHUX. So EHUX is short for Emiliania huxii. Um, we know that the, um, the lifts are composed uh, of calcium carbonate, the crocoliths are composed of calcium carbonate that's quite widespread. But are the viruses that infect these organisms also uh, very widespread? I'm seeing questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm not going to be able to respond to them, but Lou, if there's anything that's pressing, feel free to, to interrupt me. Um, or I can address questions at the end. Um, and so, so uh, we might want to know, you know, are, is the ocean kind of undergoing lots of outbreaks um, of, of viruses? Because uh, we know that they exist. And are these organisms and other microbes that live in the ocean undergoing these, these um, kinds of uh, uh, outbreaks? Um, and so a good place to begin to look at this happens to be um, in Norway, uh, because there's an, a region that's highlighted with this red circle here. Um, that, that has a, a, um, a fjord, a region there that, that very reliably has blooms um, of, of Emiliania huxii. So it's a really useful place to study these organisms. Um, and so shown here uh, is a photograph um, from an experiment that was conducted by uh, Kay Bible's group at Rutgers University. And uh, what's shown here are um, on the right um, are some uh, mesocosm bags. And so um, mesocosm translates to to the middle world. Uh, so this is a way for scientists to, to um, study um, Emiliania huxii in their natural environment. Um, and it's a nice cross between a laboratory that's very controlled and artificial um, and the real world that's quite noisy um, and difficult to, to study. Um, so these mesocosm experiments um, are conducted in Bergen because they have the facilities and because this fjord is uh, really reliable for these, um, uh, these E. huxii blooms emerging. Um, and so we can use this study site then to uh, help us uh, give some insight about, about the activity of viruses in this natural system and to help us understand the roles that viruses uh, may have played um, in, in sending uh, uh, calcium carbonate that's in the lifts of these Emiliania huxii um, to the seafloor over, over very uh, long timescales. Okay? But this is just a little sneak peek um, with these experiments. And so this is uh, results of a, of a paper from 2012. Um, these are experimental results from this field. Uh, so on the upper left here, I'm showing the, um, the, the exact location um, where these experiments were conducted. And the upper right is a little uh, zoom in on the, um, the mesocosm bags. On the lower left here, I'm showing the abundance of um, Emiliania huxii um, over about a two week long experiment, the different lines, um, the, the, the different, the black line and the different grey lines with the symbols um, are from different bags, different experimental bags. And so you see this Emiliania huxii, um, there's a large uh, increase in the first week or two um, and then that, that increase is, um, uh, begins to plateau and then it goes down, right? And so on the bottom right hand side um, is the abundance of uh, these EHV viruses, so these are viruses that infect Emiliania huxii. Um, and so the, the abundance of these is, is by the way, um, uh, sort of cryptically written here, um, but each of these numbers is, is times 10 to the 7. So, so you're looking at about 10 million cell uh, virus particles, sorry, per, per milliliter here. Um, but what these uh, researchers uh, showed was that the, the abundance of these virus particles um, after the first two weeks um, uh, increased significantly. And this increase that you're seeing on the, in the right-hand side here 
happens at the same time um, as the decrease in the, the EHV uh, host uh, concentra um, uh, concentrations. So um, they've been able to show by various means that the decline in the hosts here is, is happening because these viruses are infecting the hosts and causing them to lise. And so um, you may be uh, sick by now of looking at, at figures like this, but it, but it may also uh, remind you um, if you're anything like me and you've been staring at, at images of, of uh, exponential growth uh, uh, curves and, and um, looking at the spread of COVID-19, um, this, this figure may remind you of that. So this is just that same graph from the previous slide, just uh, blown up a little bit. Um, and so you see this exponential increase in the virus uh, abundance after the first, um, after about uh, a week or so. Um, and this uh, sort of mathematically seems to resemble what we're currently experiencing with the spread of, um, of COVID-19, right? Um, and so, so this gives us a little insight. It would appear that there is some uh, viral lysis. We can certainly mimic this um, in, a, in a mesocosm um, in Norway. Um, and this gives us some insight. But we want to know, is this, uh, this infection by viruses, is this really widespread? Is this something that happens elsewhere, not just in this fjord um, in Norway, but in other parts of the ocean that we haven't uh, yet sampled. Um, and so uh, models, mathematical models, are a really useful tool for helping us to explore that. Um, but what we need to be able to do to be able to make that extrapolation, to do that extrapolation, is to understand the rule or the set of rules that determine whether or not these blooms happen in the first place. Okay, and so um, if anyone saw uh, Nina Fetterman's talk uh, last week, she uh, showed a, a diagram very similar to this, and I'm just, uh, shamelessly copying it. Um, so so the, the way that we can use a model to try and understand whether um, there are large-scale infections um, of Emiliania Huxleyi um, is to develop a set of equations that's shown in the upper right here um, that we think describes the principles um, that underlie why these emerge. Um, and then we can, we can test or compare these, these uh, hypothetical uh, models that we um, uh, define ourselves um, with some real world data, right? So we can use the data from the fjord experiment, but we can also possibly use other data and try and build slowly up to, to get a, a big picture perspective um, of how this works. And so given that we're going from a single fjord to um, maybe to the global ocean, we maybe want to be a little bit cautious uh, and not just assume that there's a single model that works. Um, and what we can do instead is to develop multiple different models that we think might describe uh, the process um, or the, the set of processes that underlie whether these uh, infections happen. Um, and then we can treat these models as scientific hypotheses and compare the models um, with data that we collect from Norway and elsewhere um, to get, help give us a sense of whether or not we're really understanding the set of rules that determine whether or not these virus outbreaks happen. So um, for the rest of today's talk, um, I'm gonna describe uh, in some detail two different models that have contrasting hypotheses. And, and because I guess this is topical, I can kind of uh, spin it in a way that maybe people can relate to. Um, so I'm gonna call model A uh, the epidemics are everywhere model. So this is a situation um, where these poor microbes are living in the ocean and they're undergoing constant COVID-19-like um, epidemics, these outbreaks that are happening continuously. Um, that's the first model that I'm gonna describe in some detail. And the second model um, hypothesizes that nature has flattened the curve. So it's been good at um, defending against viral infection um, and it's helped to overcome um, these, uh, 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 or prevent these outbreaks from happening in the first place. So I'm going to describe the different models, and then I'm going to explain how I can compare these models with experimental and, and um, uh, observational data. So I'm going to show the equations briefly, but I'm also going to start by um, representing them um, in various different graphical ways. Okay? So the model that I've been using to um, uh, encapsulate hypothesis A, and this is very similar to the model that um, Nina Pfefferman showed last week, this is the basic principle that gives rise to epidemics in a mathematical model. I'm just going to um, describe it, or this version of it, using uh, uh, these circles. Okay, so all organisms um, have to acquire resources. That's depicted in this left-hand circle here, um, with the dashed outlines, this blue circle. Um, 
well, let's consider um, a host that's feeding on a resource, um, and that's this green circle with the solid outline. And then let's also consider a virus that's feeding on that host, okay? So the model that is actually written with a set of equations um, um, can be depicted with these circles, and the arrows between the different circles represents the flow of material between the different, um, uh, different populations or the, uh, the resource. Um, okay, so just as a, as a very brief demonstration for how this works, let's imagine just hypothetically some um, ar you know, arbitrary initial uh, condition, uh, initial position of the model. There's, there's many uh, resources, there's many of these blue circles um, with a dashed outline. Um, there's, uh, there's only, there's a moderate amount of the, of the hosts that are feeding upon this resource, um, and there's a very small amount of the virus with the, the dotted red uh, outline um, that can feed upon the hosts, right? Now, the assumption that's baked into this model um, is that, and I'm sort of aggregating these different um, components here, the assumption that's baked into this model is that if there's lots of resource and there are, if there are some hosts that can feed upon this resource, then after some time, there'll be consumption of the resource and there'll be uh, uh, more, that'll be transferred into the hosts, there'll be more hosts um, and there'll also be more viruses, right? So this is this middle um, condition here. Um, and so, so this process is gonna repeat itself again uh, if there are some, uh, still some resources available um, and there are some, some hosts available then the viruses um, will be able to feed on those hosts and, and grow, right? And so for about the last two months, maybe we've been sort of somewhere around uh, the, the beginning and middle of these three different, um, of this different uh, hypothetical scenario. And what we're currently trying to do is to avoid the scenario on the right hand side where you've got all of these viruses, very few hosts and very little resources. Um, so this is the end point of this model and then it may repeat itself if there's some more resources that are put in to the ocean, but, it, but what this, um, the defining feature of this then is that resources that come in are just shunted through the host pool and also into the virus pool um, and we get these uh, large uh, changes in the resource um, and in, and in the, the host and in the virus um, and it's, there's lots of fluctuations that happen in response to changes in, in a resource uh, that may be entering it in, a, in a variable way because uh, resources are inherently variable often. Um, and so this is the set of equations that I'm using to describe uh, this system. Um, the key thing or the thing that drives this is this SR. Uh, so this is an external forcing. Um, R, H and V are just, which is my resource. Uh, so Nina called R a, a recovered population, but I'm gonna call this the resource. Um, there's the uh, hosts and there's the viruses. Um, and then there is transfer between the different pools according to just a simple uh, uh, mass action um, assumption. Um, I can make this more complicated. I can put some fancy nonlinear uh, functions in there and that anything that's monotonically increasing gives um, sort of qualitatively the same response in response to these uh, uh, shifts in this external um, supply, which is uh, SR. Um, Okay, so that's the sort of mathsy bit, but, but it can be quite uh, accessibly um, viewed through the uh, simulations that I'm showing here. So this is just the solutions to those equations that represent the, the processes that I um, explained in the circles. So in the top here, what I'm showing um, is the resource that's fluctuating in response to an external um, change in resource supply. Um, in the middle panel, I'm showing the abundance of hosts and the abundance of viruses. Um, and then in the bottom panel, I'm showing, whoops, um, I'm taking away the time component and I'm plotting viruses as a function of the hosts. Um, and the diagonal dashed uh, line in the bottom there um, is just a one-to-one -one line, okay? Um, and so this is the epidemics are everywhere model because what we, this is showing the, the host, that red line, particularly in the middle plot, going up and down, um, which is sort of a um, representative of this epidemic dynamic, right? Uh, sorry, the viruses are going up and down, um, which is representative of this epidemic dynamic. And so we don't want this to happen and many organisms that have to defend against viral infection also don't want this to happen. So model B hypothesizes that nature has been quite good um, at flattening the curve. Now we have a bunch of uh, you know, analysts, um, 
and policymakers who are determining exactly how to go about flattening the curve, and we're all being very uh, uh, diligent and careful in doing our social distancing. But how might nature have, have done this without knowing um, or without having advice um, from analysts, right? Um, and so Model B uh, builds in a, a mechanism that can prevent this from happening uh, naturally. Um, to describe Model B, um, I'm going to use a different uh, currency. Um, and this is partly because um, I just like thinking about this currency um, uh, or this set of currencies. And also it's to sort of emphasize that this model is, is really a, an artificial construct. Okay, so I'm showing a different food web here. It's not got viruses, it's not got um, uh, hosts in it. Um, it's got different resources and I'm gonna call the host now is gonna be a producer and the virus is gonna be a consumer. Um, and so I, can, I don't really know anything at all about how uh, these meerkats, which is this, this producer that I'm showing here, I don't really know anything at all about how they feed upon the resources that they, uh, that they depend upon or how they're preyed upon. But I can still use the model to make a hypothesis about how that might happen, and I can evaluate the validity of that hypothesis um, if I can collect some data on these organisms. But the real reason that I'm showing this is just because it gives a slightly different representation of the exact same uh, process that maybe is a little bit more relatable. So, so let's just think about model um, A now, whereas previously I showed it with the different circles, um, and I showed this, the size of the circles changing. Let's now imagine a situation where there's a, a big influx of resources for whatever reason, maybe they immigrated or maybe they, the, the resource itself was able to suddenly feed upon a bunch of uh, tasty food. Model A says that this resource is just, is just um, fed upon very rapidly by this meerkat that's aggressively foraging for the resource and then is fed upon in turn by the consumer and that leads to these, these oscillations. So the, so the material um, that that is passing through the system goes back and forth uh, in quite an erratic way, right? This is model A, and this is baked into the assumptions of the, the, those equations. I'm not saying this is how this works, this is, this is a hypothesis. So how can this be disrupted? How can nature flatten the curve? Well, all it would take would be for there to be a, a producer, something that's competing or maybe as part of the same population as, the, as this uh, foraging meerkat, that has a more uh, defensive uh, trait, right, that, that, um, that possibly is selected for, um, especially maybe if there's a, a, a large input of resources, um, and that could help to reduce the number of consumers um, and increase the number of pr producers um, and also enable a more stable uh, resource pool that can be fed upon by those producers. So, so all organisms are trying to play this game, just as we now are kind of um, trying to decide whether or not to be these uh, uh, meerkats that are standing on guard or the meerkats that are foraging, although the meerkats aren't really socially distancing, so there's a, the analogy breaks down a little bit there. Um, the defensive meerkats aren't socially distancing. But we can think about every organism having to balance um, resource availability um, with uh, protection uh, against top-down control and so we can build into this model the general assumption that instead of just being uh, uh, passively responding to these uh, shifts in resource availability and this being passed through uh, the system we can allow different types of, of organism with different um, allocations of time energy um, and material between different functions and this can be expressed generally and arbitrarily mathematically um, and I'm showing that with these just these white and black uh, squares here. Um, so this is uh, a minor adjustment to the other model um, that makes it model B, right? And so I've been talking in this very abstract way about meerkats that I don't actually know anything about. Um, but, but there are um, analogues of this in the ocean. Um, now the meerkats, uh, they may switch between being, um, you know, foraging for food and defending against top-down control. Um, and, and a single meerkat may be able to make that shift. Um, but in many instances, um, the result of this trade-off has led to different species that have very fixed traits, um, and they're not able to just adaptively suddenly um, change what they do. Uh, but nevertheless, um, they uh, have a strong influence um, on whether or not um, there are um, large outbreaks of viruses uh, in the ocean, right? And so, so I'm giving two examples here of which uh, there are many, but, but Prochorococcus is a great one. So that's these uh, blobs in the top here. This is the sort of 
superlative foraging meerkat. This is the ultimate um, phytoplankton resource competitor. It's very, very small, it's very, very streamlined, and um, it's uh, very, very well equipped to access resources. And that strategy is extremely um, successful when resources are limiting. Emilia huxleyi, which we talked about at the beginning, um, this has uh, properties which are quite costly, so much in the same way as a meerkat that's standing around looking um, for the eagle isn't able to forage for food. Um, this E. huxleyi that has to um, that, that has to carry around this heavy shell uh, may not be as good uh, as competitive as competing for the resource. Um, and so, so shifts between these different strategies may happen and may have quite a profound effect um, in structuring this system. Okay. And so we can use a very similar set of equations here, um, again with linear mass action, um, but we can enforce there to be a trade-off um, between alpha um, and phi, so alpha is the um, interaction strength that connects the resource and the host, um, and phi um, is the interaction strength that connects the host and the virus. Um, and so I've forced a trade-off in this slightly odd way um, where I've got the reciprocal um, of phi in this bottom equation, um, and I've taken a logarithm of it. Um, that's because in this model there's a bit of stuff that's going on under the scenes, um, so I'm assuming actually that alpha and phi are probability distributions. Um, and I'm um, allowing the probability distributions to evolve um, in response to a changing resource supply. Um, but that's a little bit of mathematical detail that goes on underneath the hood. Um, the 1 over phi, by the way, is there because you force a trade-off um, by making it that uh, small values of phi um, uh, have high uh, allocation costs. Because remember that a small value of phi is good for the host. Anyway, that's a minor little point on the mathematics, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about that if they're interested. Um, but sort of schematically, then, going back to this idea of the circles, um, model A was this idea that, that, that material is shunted uh, uh, radically and, and, and sort of uh, um, in a very volatile way uh, between resources um, and the consumers. Um, but model B says that while um, in organisms being able to switch between being the meerkat um, that is foraging versus, versus defending, um, and uh, uh, phytoplankton cells being able to be the prochorococcus or the Emiliania huxiae, B says that that's the profound thing, that's the thing that's shaped this system. And so model A and model B are these very extreme um, uh, limits, right? And the chances are that the real world is a combination of model A and model B. But the power of this is that we can use these as um, the, the kind of um, superlative uh, sort of examples of what we'd expect if we see model A versus model B, and then we can ask what's the prevailing pattern, okay? And so, so the prevailing pattern, the, the main difference that happens when we make model B um, be true instead of model A, um, and that's shown on the right-hand side here. Um, so this has got this uh, allocation happening. The key point here is that this middle plot on the right-hand side the red line there, the amplitude of that red line, the height of that red line is much lower, right? So this is really what we want. This is what we would prefer. Um, uh, viruses that infect us, uh, we understand they may vary seasonally, but we want the amplitude of that variation to be very low. We want the model on the right-hand side to be true. We don't want the model on the left-hand side to be true. Um, looking at the model in this way, there's actually um, a little bit of redundancy uh, because this pattern just repeats itself over and over again. And for various reasons, it's a little hard to unambiguously infer this from real world data. Um, so the, the flip to the bottom panel here is what I'm gonna use in my main diagnostic. And the key point here is that the, on the left-hand side, the red line is more vertical than the dashed line. And this is because the virus abundance in this bottom left-hand panel here goes up and down uh, more than the host abundance, so the virus is swinging either side of the host, that's the bottom left-hand side. Um, on the bottom right-hand side, um, the red line is just showing the variation of the virus y-axis against the host abundance, and there's much less amplitude in the y than there is in the x, and that means that that line is flatter by comparison um, to, the, to the, the diagonal dashed line, okay? So, so distilling all of this down, um, into a single model prediction then, we can say that the model on the left-hand side, which is the epidemics are everywhere model, the scary model that viruses throughout the ocean are constantly causing epidemics, 
that's this vertical steep line when we plot the virus abundance as a function of the host abundance. Model B, which is this slightly more uh, palatable, less scary reality, is one where, where my organisms are able to constantly shift between different allocations and limit the, uh, the spread or the prevalence of, of viruses in the ocean. And so we can now treat model A and model B as being different hypotheses and we can go back to real world data and we can evaluate whether we think model A versus model B is the true model. Okay. And so we can begin with the fuel in Norway, but we can also go and see, well, are there other data out there? Are there other data that we can use to evaluate which one of these hypotheses may be true? And it turns out there's quite a lot of data out there. Um, so, so this uh, graph here is showing a compilation um, of data that was taken uh, over many years by scientists going on research cruises all over the world. Um, and so the blue dots and the green squares are, are locations that samples have gone, uh, samples, sorry, scientists have gone and taken samples of seawater and counted the number of uh, microbial hosts and the number of, uh, of, of viruses that infect those microbial hosts. Now there's a little bit of a sleight of hand here going on and people who know this data are gonna know this is not Emilianinia hupsii that are the hosts here, this is heterotrophic bacteria. But my assumption is that the same principles that underlie um, the dynamics of um, EHUPs uh, are also uh, should hold for this, um, uh, uh, these bacterial populations. Um, and I want to go uh, and look at this uh, general picture and not be focused to one specific organism. I want to look at, at how traits and how the system has adapted um, on a large scale rather than focusing in on one specific um, group. Okay. So I've got my real world view, that's the left hand side. I've got my mathematical abstract models, that's the right hand side. Now I'm primed and ready to, to actually do my uh, sort of science testing of the hypothesis. I can take the different predictions of the two different mathematical models and I can compare them against the real world data. And that's shown in this, with these question marks here. So remember, that the, the primary feature of model A was that the virus abundance on the y-axis goes up and down uh, quite uh, uh, in, in a volatile way, uh, but the, the host abundance stays relatively um, fixed. Okay, so this is this epidemics are everywhere. This is the this is the scary reality that that, that most living organisms would rather prevent. That's model A. Model B. Uh, the virus abundance stays relatively flat, the host abundance varies instead. And so we can now look at the data, the real world data, and say, well, is it closer to model A or is it closer to model B? Okay. And so each black point that you see here is a sampling point that corresponds to one of the, the blue or the green circle, uh, the blue circle or the green square that I showed on that map of the oceans. So the, each black point is where someone or a group of scientists have actually got out to sea and sampled seawater and looked at how many um, microbes and how many viruses there are. Um, and so on the y-axis here, I'm showing the virus uh, uh, particles or the number of viruses uh, per milliliter on the x-axis, I'm showing the microbes per milliliter. And it seems like the distinctive feature of this, and so, oh, sorry, I should say that the, 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 this stuff here um, is just some, some, some fitting that was done um, to these data uh, by the authors uh, that put this compilation together. <clears throat> um, and I'm, I'm being a little cheeky and only showing the, the data points that were um, from beneath 100 meters in the seawater. Um, and that's because there's a slightly cleaner signal that comes out of that. Um, so it's a little bit uh, clearer to infer um, uh, what's going on. And so, uh, so just looking at this then, what, what seems to be the main feature of this, um, without worrying about, about the numbers that are on this uh, graph here, the black data points and the, the line that goes through those black data points, this, this blue line here, appears to be more shallow uh, than the dashed uh, diagonal. Okay? So this suggests that the microbial abundance, um, uh, the host cells vary more widely than the, than the abundance of the viruses. Uh, on the y-axis, okay? And so that indicates that model B may be a better predictor of, um, of this system 
than model A, right? So remember that model B is that nature flattens the curve model. So this is, this is um, suggesting that, that nature has been able to protect against viral infection um, by having a range of different allocation strategies um, that can protect against uh, infection much in the way that the, the meerkats did. Um, uh, so it's the key point here is that it's the switching between different strategies that enables this, this, um, uh, this flattening of the curve in nature. What I haven't done, um, and what I probably should have done, is I haven't talked about the mechanisms that control whether or not these infections happen. Um, and so within the scientific literature, there's a lot of debate, um, a lot of very interesting debate about what the mechanisms are that underlie these data. Um, and there's lots of uh, experimental work that's going on currently um, to explore why this is. So what, what's, the, what's the microbial equivalent of a meerkat standing guard looking out? Um, we don't know that, that's another, another lecture. Um, but um, the point is that, that this model, Model B, this idea of organisms shifting allocation strategies, either um, within a single uh, uh, lifespan like the meerkats are, um, or um, over very much longer periods, um, over evolutionary time, um, leading to the separation um, and these distinct niches uh, that, that define Proprococcus versus Emiliania hapsii. Um, this model seems to be, um, and the, the impact of this um, shifting allocation and this, the impact this has on flattening the curve, seems to be a better predictor um, of the data that we observe uh, naturally um, than one that just allows epidemics to happen all of the time, okay? Um, and so, so for me to say uh, that, that, you know, we know for sure that, that Emiliania hutzii has these, these lifts um, because it wants to protect against our infection, that would be um, a little bit of a stretch, right? We don't know that that's actually true. Um, we think that, they, that there's a cost involved um, and that there's likely to be some benefit that's associated with resisting, um, sort of flattening the curve in this way. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there is some viral infection um, and we're still very much in the process of, of, of really characterizing in detail exactly what the main drivers um, of, of these, uh, these distributions are, right? But the, but the key thing here is that the model gives us a clue um, to help us understand um, uh, why certain uh, sort of large-scale macroscopic uh, properties have, have, have emerged uh, in the ocean um, and to begin to think about some of the mechanisms that may um, have led to uh, different um, uh, organisms protecting against viral uh, infection um, and, and to evaluate the success of those adaptations in preventing uh, viral outbreaks from happening in the ocean. Um, and so this is a sort of preliminary analysis and it doesn't, um, it doesn't say that outbreaks don't happen ever. Um, there's certainly uh, reason to think that the viral infection may be extremely prevalent, extremely um, uh, common in the ocean, um, but nature may have been quite successful at flattening the curve, um, much in a way, or in a similar way to the way that we are currently uh, flattening the curve, right? in analogous ways. Um, and so one of the things that I find interesting about this, so I can't say for sure that, that you know, these lifts, these calcium carbonate shells are really to protect against uh, viruses or other grazers. Um, but, but this is the thing that we see that has this lasting uh, signal um, on Earth, right? So this is, uh, when we go to trips to the sea, this is, this is what we see, right? So we can't actually attribute the link explicitly um, between Emiliania huxley and the lifts on the outside to, to protect you against viral infection and other predators. Um, but we can use the models um, as a way to help us make links in our mind between things um, that might be difficult to relate otherwise, right? So this is a, a single-celled uh, microbe that's only a few um, thousandths um, of a millimeter wide. Um, that lives uh, across the ocean on the right hand side and then we've got this rock formation that's um, many many uh, miles long uh, and that's formed over millions of years um, historically and so so the models are a really useful way of making links that that we have to be um, to think a lot of abstractly about. So the summary here um, is that mathematical models are, are a useful way to understand uh, the rules that control whether or not outbreaks happen uh, in nature 
Um, nature may have flattened the curve um, by uh, adapting to different uh, resource conditions and adapting to different um, uh, pressures um, in, in response to, to shifts in, re in resource conditions. Um, and and, and this, this, this pressure to defend against viral infection and to other top-down controls um, has had a really profound influence on the development um, of Earth um, and, and of uh, the uh, ecosystems that are uh, common in it. So um, that, that's, uh, that's the end of the talk. Um, and uh, I am I'm, I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you all for listening. David, thank you very much. Um, that was a wonderful connection between items that I had never thought about, the cliffs of Dover and, and viruses. So uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, there are a, a set of questions. I'm going to start with the ones that have the highest number of thumbs up. Okay. 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 The first one, uh, doesn't Emiliana Huxley die? How do we know that natural death processes is insufficient to have de deposits form in thousands of years or millions, perhaps, in this case? That's a, that's a, a fantastic question. And uh, the short answer is, um, I, I don't know. Um, we think that they do, they do naturally die. Um, they do just spontaneously just, just explode in response to, for example, nutrient limitation. Um, that's definitely a loss process. Um, there are many loss processes and, and part of the challenge, that's a great question, I should have made that clearer, part of the challenge of the research that we're doing is, is to be able to identify which are the dominant loss processes, which are the, the prevailing features that define the system. Okay, um, and, and then an associated question on the list is in the model, the death of virus is a you had a delta squared term there. Yes. Why is it delta squared rather than just delta? Oh, that's a great question. I, 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 uh, I saw it once I finished giving the blurb about that and I thought that I was gonna uh, go on about the maths for too long, but I appreciate the question. So um, going back to like the 70s, that quadratic term is hypothesized to mimic um, things feeding on viruses. So we, we know it's a little uh, kind of weird to think about, but, but viruses actually are, are kind of prey to other organisms in the ocean. There's things they have, you know, nutrition in them, and there's other things that can consume and eat viruses. Um, and whenever we make these models, um, one of the biggest uh, weaknesses and one of the biggest things that we struggle with is, is accounting for things that are not in the models, right? And so that, that, that squared term is a sort of quick and dirty way um, of accounting for um, uh, things that cause viruses to die that we haven't actually explicitly um, uh, represented in the model. Um, that's, that's how it was intended by me. Um, you can also put linear terms in there um, and it doesn't really change the, the solutions that much, but that, having that quadratic term in there is kind of important um, to keep the structure uh, as if there were higher, uh, higher things uh, feeding on the viruses as well. Okay, thanks. Um... And this goes into the functional form as well. The model is described is linear, yet virus activity will drive resource availability. Is there a way to uh, circularize this, to actually include that, I guess, feedback uh, to driving resource availability that uh, may arise from virus activity? I see, yeah, to, to, to be able to close the loop. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, work in progress, I guess, uh, is the, the answer to that. Um, so, so explicitly having it so that the, the, the activity of viruses helps um, to regenerate the material and, and return it back to the resource pool, um, that's, not, that's not included in this model. Um, uh, I, I, I sort of start to struggle with the maths a little bit when we put that in there, but I'm, I'm working on it. So if you ever ask me that question, drop me an email if you've got any, any ideas, and I'd love to work on it with you. <laughs> Okay, um, you touched on this. Um, I'll let you maybe expound on it a bit. Uh, how costly is the defense against viruses? Uh, does it really work uh, via resource allocation or is it something else? Ooh, that's another uh, great question. Um, I think that it's quite difficult to quantify. So, so um, you know, the cost, there's various different ways that organisms um, can allocate resources to protect against viral infection. I used 
uh, eHux because it's the, the and the lifts in eHux because that's the, the cleanest link um, with the kind of large scale geologic um, features that, that I talked about. Um, but there, there are a, a bunch of other different mechanisms and there's probably extremely diverse uh, costs associated with it. Um, and I think I, my feeling is that we're only really at, at the beginning of actually um, explicitly quantifying them. Um, what I find kind of interesting, I guess, is that there seems to be a signal in the data that, that suggests that there is some active um, uh, allocating or, or, or changes in allocation that are happening um, to, to overcome those costs. Okay, great. All right, now this is a very different question. Okay. Could, could coral bleaching that's attributed to global warming often be actually caused by a viral epidemic? Oof. Oh, we're going out a little bit outside of my, uh, <laughs> my expertise there. Uh, co coral bleaching, so that's a, 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 a die-off in the... the, the um, I'm trying to think, maybe someone can help me out. That's a die-off in that there's a mutualism, right, between, between uh, photosynthetic organisms um, and, and the, uh, the corals that they live in, the animal host. So that, so that could certainly, uh, that, could, that could be a factor that's involved. Um, it's likely one that, uh, if it is a thing, it's probably exacerbated by the, 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 the shifts in climate that are making that um, association uh, less, less stable. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but it, it could be. Um, okay. um, uh, here's another comment, uh, question. The data, uh, and I think this is referring to your data uh, towards the end, data on the log scale. Yes. And models are on the linear scale. Oh, man. Wow. Uh, I was going to say yeah. that. I, yeah, it's a little bit of a sleight of hand there. I apologize for that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I did. I did. I cheated a little bit, and I did not. I should have. I should have put the model results on a log scale. Um, so when you do that, um, you can. You the model. The model that I showed actually, if you log it, you get you get a linear relationship. So you do need to do something else to make it that sublinear relationship. Um, what I, I kind of find it a bit more interesting. Not necessarily the difference between being linear versus sublinear, but 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 more just looking at the. the um, independent of that, whether or not there's a, a strongly superlinear or other relationship that exists relative um, to the uh, to the to the the properties of that slope once it's been logged. So I apologise if that if that's a, a really um, confused way of answering that question. Um, to put it to put it differently, the, the results that I showed um, are robust uh, regardless of whether or not I, I log transform um, the model solutions. Um, or if I uh, exponentiate the data. Um, and, and yeah, that's again something that I would love to talk to someone about, but I, I appreciate that question. Yeah, okay. One of, one of the folks responded that the viruses are still varying over uh, one to two orders of magnitude because yeah. of the log scale. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's a, that's a really good point. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so here's another one. I'd heard that calcium carbonate deposits were largely due to extinct coral reefs. Is there a possible association between these two processes, the viral diatom ones and the coral reefs? Another um, certainly, yeah, uh, they, they, they could be. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen any, any data on that. Um, I know that there are, and I, I should have said this, I know that there are lots of other organisms that contribute towards those, uh, the formation of those, um, those large chalk deposits. Um, uh, I think that the, the extent of the of the, the coccolithophore blooms um, is so large that, that they are a, a, a good candidate for being the primary uh, source. But I would be um, intrigued and interested to know if there's data that said otherwise. Mm -hmm. Is there actually information about whether those blooms have gone on for? the time periods associated with the, that, that, that would be necessary? I mean, these are you know, very, very, very long time scales. Yeah, so we're getting into the realms of paleobiology here, which I, I, I'm not an expert in, but I think that uh, that's been uh, really well uh, characterized um, and, and dated, yeah. Okay, um, this is a question about the curves in the model. Uh, wouldn't there be a slight shift between the peaks of the resource and the abundance curves? Yeah, okay. We've got, we've got a bunch of math bio people in here. I thought that it was just going to be a, 
Uh, yeah, there, there would be. So, so um, the dynamics that I showed, what I really wanted to evaluate was how the dynamics happen in response to this external forcing. Um, it's not the, it's not, it's the, the, I, and I should have made this a little clearer, but that, that cyclical pattern that you see, I apologize for not, that, that, was, that was enforced by me by that SR, the shifts in that SR. It's not a typical Locke of Altera type situation when you have this um, sort of successional dynamic. So there, there is a little bit of, I agree, there's a little bit of surprising um, synchronicity in the resource um, dynamics uh, as well as with the, the host and the virus. Um, that's that's uh, interesting, and that's that's a property of um, coding. It's so that you've got this external input, and I think also the quadratic loss at the end, um, and that that structures the system and it, and it embeds it and places it in the context um, of an environment that's that's where the dynamics that, that are in, in the model are, are kind of emerge from yes from the coupling of the of, of the model itself, but also from the external inputs and the, and the loss um, outside. So that that's a great question. Um, but there's a sort of deliberate, um, uh, with leaning deliberately on the um, on the, the 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 primary forcing and the closure term. Okay. Um, now here's a uh, another modeling question. Yes. How are you applying your predator prey or producer consumer model to the model of the virus abundancy? What assumptions are you making, and what additional information? Do we need to do that? Um, how am I applying it? Interesting. Um, uh, it says, how, how are you applying your predator prey or view it as producer consumer model mm -hmm. to the model of viral abundance? Um, so, so in this extremely uh, quick and dirty uh, presentation, um, I applied it by just using the different contrasting model predictions, model A versus model B, and summarizing the relationship between the host abundance um, and the, the virus abundance in model A versus model B. Um, and, and then just, just in a very uh, um, sort of qualitative way, just comparing and contrasting whether or not the data that I'm looking at um, agree with model A versus model B. There's all kinds of... Um, considerations and things that I should, if I'm being really robust about it, um, ways that I can evaluate um, quantitatively uh, the validity of model A versus model B. Um, but I was just using a very, um, for the purposes of this presentation, a very uh, qualitative demonstration of the, um, the differences between the different models. Okay. So here's a uh, question that's a virology question, I guess. How yeah. many viruses can emerge from a single infected Emiliana Huxley? Oh, I, I guess it depends how you count. <laughs> what what yeah, do you count? There's a range of different ways that it can be done. Um, so this is referred to as the, the burst size. Um, I think I forget exactly what the number, but it's on the order of several hundred for um, So you get several hundred uh, teeny tiny little uh, virus particles from a single host. Um, and that's because even though the host is, is very small, the viruses themselves are also much, much smaller. Okay. Um, if only a fraction of microbes can be infected by the viruses, perhaps the same correlation with slope less than one can be observed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, I guess the way I see it, yeah, that's totally, that's absolutely. Uh, so they're asking about about if you if you've got very selective um, uh, feeding. Uh, so what what the model does, and I, and I probably should have given Freddie Thinkstad a little bit more credit for for actually um, the inspiration for, for, for how these models are built. This is really, what underlies this is the, is the kill the winner um, model, really. Uh, so, so it assumes, uh, and Selena Vogue as well have done work on this. So, so looking, um, you know, the model basically hypothesizes that you have this, um, uh, partly why you have this selectivity is because many, many hosts have evolved uh, defensiveness. Um, to the to the viruses, so that so that so that selectivity is something that's that's an emergent feature rather than something that's um, imposed. Um, uh, yeah. So this is a this is a great sort of question that I think has affected lots of people working in mesocosms. Um, how representative are the Fjord experiments? Um, you know, so the algae and viruses are limited in where they are. Water movement is restricted. That's not true in the real ocean. So, 
Um, I, I know this is a general question that arises in any kind of uh, attempt to mimic real world ecosystems in a controlled sort of framework. Yeah, uh, so it's really it's really problematic, right? And that's why that's partly I think why the models are really valuable. Um, so those experimental data that I showed, um, that they those uh, they enrich the mesocosms so that their cell uh, uh, densities were on the order of about ten thousand uh, cells per milliliter, um, which is a couple of orders of magnitude higher. It's a couple of thousand times larger than than we typically find the mediae and RCI. Uh, in the ocean, and that's that's one um, caveat associated with these mesocosm experiments. Um, and I think part of the reason why that's done is because ne ne they are so noisy, and that it, they, they can be very problematic to work with. Um, so to get clean signal, it, it helps to enrich things um, a little bit. I think uh, I wouldn't want to speak for the, the, the authors who did that study, um, uh, but um, yeah, it's extremely challenging, extremely problematic, and so and so writing down um, models that that depend and lean heavily on on principles. Um, that you can evaluate in a range of different contexts, um, not just in the mesocosm, but also with laboratory growth curve data, uh, helps to ground truth things a little bit. And we do a lot of that as well. So. Okay. Um, and uh, if, if model A occurs in different parts of the ocean with different cycle amplitude and phase, on average, the density may be quite average. In other words, model A may work fine. In other words, Yes. How do you account for different spatial differences here? Well, I'm so, sorry, can you repeat that again? Yeah, it, it, if model A occurs in different parts of the ocean with different cycles of amplitude and phase, on average, the density may be quite average. In other words, model A may work, work out to have a similar kind of phase structure. I'm not sure that that's true, but... Yeah, <laughs> I don't quite follow that because if if... If we if we have this sort of uh, cycling happening, I don't well I don't quite know how that, how that would work. I'd be interested to see how you could have a model. Maybe you could, right? I'd, maybe maybe I'd be intrigued to see how that works, right? If you had lots of different um, cycles that are happening um, that are maybe uh, in such a way that, that when you sample a lot of that variability just goes away. Um, I'd be intrigued to, to see how that how that would work. Okay, well, this. This goes along, I think, with the issue that um, there's there's not really any spatial component to the simplified models, yes. um, and uh, and the underlying sort of behavior controlling the viruses is due to different responses of different potential host species, uh, rather than as you indicated in the meerkat case. Uh, different behaviors of the same host species. Mm -hmm. So I think this brings up the question of how do you uh, potentially model spatially different collections yes. of, of host species? Uh, <laughs> great question. I, I mean, that's kind of the million dollar question in a way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, whether or not these adaptations can happen as a result of succession of different organisms that have evolved to occupy these different niches or whether it can happen as a, in a sort of acclimated way. Um, it probably depends upon uh, the time scale of environmental variability and whether or not um, the adaptation, be it um, uh, sort of ecological or, or evolutionary or, or otherwise, um, if that can keep up. Um, and that, that's quite a complex question, I think. Um, and it's one that uh, uh, I think a lot of people are working on. So um, it's interesting. It's a great question. All right. Um, and then there's one more here. Are there other phase spaces you look at apart from the virus host abundance one? The virus host abundance phase spaces. Yeah, we could do the same thing with the resources as well. Um, uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure if that's leading somewhere or if that's. Well, no, I think it's just a matter that, you know, that, that was a typical phase diagram for, you know, host, predator host, consumer, you know, resource kind of, not re resource in this case, but. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and in some models, you look at all kinds of different phase spaces if there's many different um, components of the system. And I guess that's what that's getting at. Yeah, yeah, so, so my, my interest is in, is in the entire microbial community, uh, largely. I, I focused on viruses, um, but, but um, you know, part of the reason why it, 
helps to be a little quick and dirty sometimes is, is, that, is that if we want to extend to, to include material cycling in all of these different pools, um, we have to be quite ruthless with how we, with which uh, primary features we, we extract. Um, that's not to say that these uh, sort of nuanced mechanisms are not important and, and interesting and useful to study, and I do do that as well. But in the interest of trying to look at the prevailing uh, features and um, the dominant features, uh, I, I find um, this, this contrast quite useful. Um, all right. Well, um... David, thank you very much. We've gone through the list of questions in, okay. in order, pretty much. And obviously, this has generated a, a bunch of interest, uh, including from several of your colleagues. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'll probably be getting a hard time after this. Yeah, but, uh, but we're getting thanks uh, uh, sent to us on the, on the chat, too. And, uh, and I really appreciate your time. So uh, thanks to all the audience. Um, we will uh, close this out, and for those that are interested in somewhat more general uh, issues of modeling, the process of modeling, and the objectives of modeling, and how to evaluate models of different types, um, I will do that next week along with some comments about different modeling approaches that are taken for uh, coronavirus. So um, thanks, uh, thanks to everybody for... Uh, being on and uh, we will close out. Thank you.